Order of the Wicked, Chapter 4 Hall was definitely the wrong word for the cavern Knox led her to. Cathedral was more like it. The cave was practically the size of her old village. The ceiling was so far overhead that it was lost in darkness. But long stalactites of glittering crystal reached downward out of the sh shadows, reflecting the light of dozens of chandeliers that floated over a single long oak table that stretched the entire length of the cavern. More glowing veins of some crystal that lit the hallway streaked across the floor and up the hall walls. Combined with the chandeliers, the effect was almost dazzling, despite the fact that they were underground. A fire the size of a small house burned in the vast hearth at the far end of the cavern. Behind it, a foaming lavender waterfall descended from an opening in the ceiling, sending out clouds of jasmine-scented mist. Naked, chubby-winged pixies capered in out of the water, giggling and splashing each other with tufts of foam. Best of all, a small army of flutter budgets darted back and forth, setting the table with gleaming silverware and starched white napkins, filling cut glass goblets with sparkling water, and bearing huge platters of more kinds of food than Lana Del had ever seen in one place in her life, singing jam fruits that periodically burst into a noisy squelch, sending sugary paste everywhere, piping hot portal pastries baked in the shapes of flowers and trees, fish jiggles that poured themselves into silver bowls, arguing fiercely about which about with each other about who should get eaten first. Oz delicacies that Londadel had only heard of but never imagined actually existed. She gasped out loud. Glamora really missed the banquet hall at the Emerald Palace, Nox said at her side, slightly amused by her wonder. She's the only one of us who really cares about all this stuff, to be honest, so we let her do whatever she wants. Even though it takes a lot of her energy to keep up appearances, it means a lot to her. Appearances? Lonidale asked. But as she looked more closely at the dazzling spectacle of the dining hall, she suddenly understood what Knox meant. The flutter budgets were setting the same places at the table over and over again. If she start stared long enough at the chandeliers, their outlines blurred, and she could see through them in the walls of the cave beyond them. The firelight flickered at the same repeating patterns. The fizz giggle climbed into their bowls in the same endless order. The jam fruit's song was stuck on a loop. And although the t long table was polished in a blinding glow and set with dozens of places, only a handful of people sat at the end closest to Knox and Lana Del. Gert, Glamora, Melindra, Mombi, and a boy and a girl Lana Del didn't recognize. The boy had long, white, blonde hair that he kept pushing out of his eyes, and a pale, serious face. The girl was a munchkin. Her muscular, blue-skinned arms were decorated with delicate, pale tattoos of vines and flowers, and her blue-black hair was shaved at the end so that only a long lock remained at the top of her head. All of them were dressed in training clothes, but the munchkin and the pale boys looked somehow more expensive and carefully tailored than Melinda's torn and patched clothes, as if they never actually worn them to train in. All of them were ignoring the darting flutter budgets, hovering dishes of food, and exploding pastries. It's fake, Lonadel said as understanding standing dawned. Knox shrugged. It's an illusion, he said, low enough to so Glamora didn't hear him. Not actually the same thing. It's real magic. You just can't eat the food. Is it like this all the time? She changes it up. Last winter it got so cold we couldn't train outside for a while, so she turned it into a big sunny outdoor picnic in here. Blue sky overhead, sunshine and all. For a while it looked exactly like Rainbow Falls. That was my favorite. You could even feel the mist on your face if you got close to the waterfall. But Mombi complained the water noises made her have to pee at every meal. But why? Londell asked. Why go all through, through all the trouble? It's a good reminder of what we're fighting for, Gert said from across the table. How had she heard what Knox was saying? Londell wondered if she could read lips. Or minds. Not just freedom, but the way things are supposed to be. Knox is meant to be a place of joy and delight for everyone who lives here. If Dorothy has her way, all of that will change, Knox added. He had a far-off look in his eyes. Everyone who joins the wicked has lost something. He told her when he, she'd first arrived. Had his life been all about banquet halls and magical pastries before he learned how to fight? Well, he wasn't the only one who had lost his entire family. And what do you think? I don't need illusions, he said flatly, looking away. My life was never like this, Lonidel said frankly, and Knox's gaze focused on her again. Not before Dorothy, I mean. I lived in a tiny village. My family was poor. 
we didn't have banquets and picnics. There was always too much work to do. I've never eaten any of this stuff or been waited on or been to the Rainbow Falls or... You know what I mean, Nox said tiredly. Can we not argue about Oz's economic conditions right now? She was about to snap back a retort, but she swallowed it. For the first time, she felt sorry for Knox. Sometimes it seemed like he was carrying the entire weight of the order on his, admittedly muscular, shoulders. Sure, she said quietly. Sorry. Something like gratitude flashed across his face and was gone. So even the high and mighty Mox, Knox had regular emotions every now and then. Lonadale filed that piece of information for later. What are you doing standing here like a monkey just flew off with your dinner? Someone was yelling from the table, and Lonadale immediately recognized Melindra's raspy voice. Sit down, you idiots. The food's getting cold. Knox shook his head as if he was trying to push out unwelcome thoughts and slid into an empty place next to Melindra. Lonadale sat down across from him, them. She couldn't help but notice that Melindra didn't quite make enough room for Knox so that he couldn't avoid touching her as he took his seat. But he didn't seem to mind. She remembered what Melindra had said about flirting with him and almost rolled her eyes before she caught herself. And then Knox put his arm around her, and she leaned into him, briefly before turning to her food. Okay, so Melinda was doing more than just flirting with him, apparently. Melinda and Knox? Anyone and Knox? It was hard to imagine the effusive, confident girl going for a riddle-spouting jerkwad, but love was weird. Not that she would know. She tried as hard as she could not to stare, but when Knox wasn't looking, Melindra winked at her, and she burst into laughter. What? Knox asked in irrita irritation, and Melindra started laughing too. What? N nothing, Melindra sang out innocently. Lonadel, glad this jackfruit finally showed you where to eat. This is Larkin, she gestured to the serious-looking boy. And Holly. The munchkin girl inclined her head. And obviously, you already know Gert and Glamora and Mombi. The old winch grunted rudely. She was shoving her bread and cheese into her mouth as though it was her last meal. And as it turned out, she chewed with her mouth open. Lonadel averted her eyes. As in deliberate contrast to the magical, illusionary banquet happening behind them, the food was almost aggressively ordinary. Bread and cheese, some kind of bland, flavorless, flavorless porridge, and a few, thankfully silent, apples. Lonadel wondered why Glamora didn't spend more time magicking up some food that actually tasted good instead of wasting all her energy on a dinner party no one could enjoy. But by now, she knew better than to ask questions. Maybe Knox was right, and the pretense was what was important. Acting as though things were normal, trying to keep our lives as close as they had been before as possible. Except that Lonadel, for Lonadel, none of it made sense. Their lives weren't what they've been before. That was the point. That was why they were all here. Pretending wasn't going to get them anywhere. It wouldn't bring back her family or change the past. The only way to return to the way things were had been before Dorothy come back to Oz was to get rid of Dorothy, and that wasn't going to happen without a fight. Lonadel was so preoccupied with her thoughts that she didn't recognize Larkin was asking her a question until she repeated it twice. Where did you learn to fight before here? She blinked. Oh, sorry, I... well, I didn't. Larkin and Holly exchanged glances. They reminded her of the head councilman's kids from her village. They had the same faintly arrogant air, as if they knew something nobody else in the room did. You've never trained before? Holly's voice dripped disbelief and scorn. At all? No, Lonardale said, bewildered. There had never been a reason to learn how to fight Nas before. Sure, there had been once wicked witches, but Dorothy had taken care of that long ago, when she first came to Oz and liberated the Munchkins and the Winkies. Larkin made a soft, snorting noise. Then what are you doing here? Can you even use magic? Holly asked in a tone that clearly suggested that if she couldn't, she was of less use than the dirt on the cavern floor. Leave her alone, Melinda said sharply, sitting up. We're all here for a reason. Let's not be twits about it. Lonadel shot the other girl a grateful look, but Holly wasn't done. If we just let anybody join the order, she began with a sneer, but Mombi cut her off. Are you questioning my judgment, girl? The witch barked. Think I'm letting in a riffraff? Is there something you'd like to say to me directly? No. Holly mumbled, letting, looking down at the table, but her face was defiant and her scornful sneer didn't relent. Mombi and Melinda are right. 
Nox added severely. You two might be more experienced fighters, but Lana Del can hold her down. She wouldn't be here if she couldn't. To her mortification, Lana Del actually flush flushed. Was Nox complimenting her? I'm here, she said pointily. You don't have to talk about me like I can't hear you. Larkin snorted again, and Mavi brought her fist down at the table with a thump. That's enough, she said sharply. Nox is right, and there are a few enough of, of us as it is. We don't need to be squabbling with each other, is that clear? Of course, Mombi, Holly said in a syrupy voice. We're sorry, aren't we? She added, elbowing Larkin. Oh, very sorry, he echoed in the same insincere, sing-songy voice. It was obvious neither one of them meant a word of it, but Mombi seemed satisfied by their apology. After they finished eating, Knox pulled her aside as the others wandered out of the dining hall. Things will be different for you, he said seriously. Your training will get harder than anything you've done before. We may need to move again against Dorothy soon. What do you mean? A member of the Order is collecting information, he said vaguely, a troubled look passing across his face. We haven't heard from her in some time. If she's been killed, well, it might mean Dorothy's reach is farther than we think. He had to be talking about the same girl Melinda had been referring to in the healing pool, but as usual, no one was going to tell her anything else, like what kind of danger this girl was in, or whether she herself would have to do the same thing soon. Melinda had tried to pretend there was nothing to worry about, but Knox was obviously concerned, and if Knox was worried, well, that was a bad sign. Lonadel could tell him that something was already on the move. Somebody that Dorothy had probably sent. Something that matched up with the rumors about crazy experiments and a creepy secret army. If Knox thought Dorothy was just sitting around in the Emerald Palace, he was wrong. But the thought of talk talking about what had happened to her was, was still too raw. Once again, she felt herself being pulled in many directions. If only she could make a different Lana Del, one that could carry the pain for her, so her real self could keep fighting without having to think about it. Knox gave her a searching look. What? Nothing, she said. It's all right. I understand. I thought you would. He nodded. You're doing well. Better than I expected, considering the state you were in when you got here and your lack of any kind of training. Better than Holly and Larkin expected, I guessed, she said. He sighed and pushed his dark hair out of his face. Holly and Larkin can be difficult, but they're good fighters, and we need them. It's better to just ignore some of their quirks. Is that what they are? Lana Dahl thought sourly. Where she was from, treating other people like garbage was more than just a quirk. It was a crappy thing to do. But Knox was right. If she just met the entire order, while it was hardly an intimidating army, even if Mombi, Gert, and Glamora were witches, and Melinda was the best fighter in Oz, it was hard to imagine a ragtag bunch defeating Dorothy's forces and restoring peace to Oz. But as far as she knew, the Order was the only game in town, and going up against Dorothy alone would be suicide. Training with the Order was the only chance she had to avenge her family. She didn't care if she died trying, but the more fighters she had at her back, the further she would get. Besides, she wasn't here to make friends. She was here to learn how to become a killing machine, and Knox and Melindra were the only people she'd met who seemed like they could teach her. She'd seen way worse than anything Holly and Larkin could do. She reminded herself. These were just minor distractions. What are you doing here? She asked suddenly. Leading the order, I mean. He smiled. I'm hardly the leader, he said. I leave that up to Gert and Mombi. But you're basically in charge of the trainees. He shrugged. I know how to fight. Melindra does too. Melindra's our best, he agreed. His expression was neutral. As usual, it was impossible to tell what he was really thinking. But she's impulsive. Gert and Mombi need someone with more control to train new members. Impulsive? Was he talking badly about his girlfriend? Was Melinda his girlfriend? And why did she even care? It's none of your business, she told herself. Is that why you don't have emotions? He looked surprised and then laughed. I have emotions, he said. It was the most honest, unguarded thing he, she'd ever heard him say, as if lurking under his harsh, controlled exterior was a completely different person. Someone who knew had to smile and laugh and think about things other than fighting and death. Was that the person Melinda got to see all the time? 
Or was he difficult with her, too? Not any that you show. I've been fighting for a long time, he said, his face closing down again. And Oz teaches you that nothing is ever what it seems. It's not a good idea to show people your true self or relax your guard. Even here? Especially here. He was suddenly distant again. Now she really wanted to know what he was talking about. Did he mean he didn't trust Melindra? Did he mean she couldn't trust Melindra? Was he just jealous of anyone else building up a relationship with Melindra? Out of the order, Melindra seemed the most untouched by all the horror of Oz. Somehow she had remained honest and open, while the rest of them toted around their scars. She wanted to ask Knox about her, if he was in love with her, if he was capable of being in love with anyone. By any chance she had of getting through his defenses to catch a glimpse of the real Knox was gone. You should get some rest, he added. Real training starts tomorrow. You need to be ready. He walked away without another word. Lanada watched him go. Why was he so insistent that no one could be trusted? It was more than just his commitments to the Order and their training. Was it what happened to his family, or being raised by Mombi, or is it something even worse? Whatever it was, it had to hurt him so deeply that it seemed he could never be able to fully trust another person. Knox wasn't her friend, but he was like her, all of his anger bottled up inside, just waiting for an outlet, putting up walls to keep himself safe. Melinda was the opposite of that. Despite all that she had gone through, she was still open to Knox and to Lonadel, and to life. In that way, Knox didn't seem to be. Lonadel wondered if it was possible for Melinda to ever break through Knox's wall. She had already somehow broken through to Lonadel. Lonadel didn't know if it was a good thing or a bad thing. They were preparing for a war with Dorothy. Was having people who she cared about something that made her a better fighter, or a more valuable one? Knox seemed to be struggling with the same question, but which side would he come down on, and what would it mean for Melindra?